Hello, my name is Ray Hughes, and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project. We are at the main library in Cincinnati, Ohio, and the date is May the 20th, 2014. Today we are speaking with Robert Lee Brewster. Uh, and Bob, uh, you are a veteran of the United States Air Force. That's correct. And we get a little background information about you, Bob. Uh, where were you born? I was born in Columbus, Ohio. My father was stationed at Fort Hayes with the 11th Infantry Band. I see. And uh, your mother, uh, what was her name? Uh, my mother was, uh, uh, maiden name was Mavis Becknell. Uh, my father's name was uh, Walter Cassad. Uh, she was from Kentucky and uh, um, they passed, uh, my mother passed at an early age when I was two and I was adopted in Columbus by the Brewsters. I um, see. Um, and what was your father's last name? Your, your, my father. Your biological father. Biological father was Cassad, C-A-S-A-D, kind of an unusual name. You don't hear it very often. His, he had been orphaned at uh, an early age as well and wa raised in, there was a soldier's home in Indiana for uh, children of uh, soldiers it. that wow. had passed on. So he was raised there, kind of interesting, in a, in a boarding school and uh, went in the Army in the early age in World War I, but never served overseas. And he was with the 11th Regiment? 11th Infantry Band, it was, yeah. at, uh, in part of the Infantry Division at Fort Hayes. I see, in Columbus. Right. I see. And uh, after your mother died, when you were two, you said? Yes. You were adopted by the Brewster family? That's correct. Uh, were they a relative of yours? or No relative. It was kind of an interesting uh, situation. The uh, post commander at Fort Hayes was a good friend of my uh, adopted father's uh, supervisor on the Norfolk and Western Railroad. And he mentioned there's this two-year-old at the post. Uh, mother passed, father's getting ready to ship out. And uh, so the Brewsters were looking to adopt and I was adopted by them and had a, a great childhood and very fortunate to have been adopted by them. My father was a railroader uh, supervisor, so he was stationed in Columbus with a Norfolk and Western I fired my first engine at four years old, uh, not with a shovel, but just turned the crank on the... the and his uh, name was what? Leslie Churchill Brewster. I just had a grandson born yesterday named Luke Churchill Brewster, so keeping the initials, yeah. and I'm sure and Grandpa was, is very proud. What was proud. your adopted mother's name? She was Juliet Phobian. Uh, they were Huguenots, originally from down in Tennessee. Again, another strange situation, kind of interesting. She was a school teacher in Cincinnati. Uh, during the war, the railroads, were, of course, were quite busy. Uh, so my father was stationed in Columbus, then to Portsmouth, which was at that time the largest single railroad yard in the world. A uh, lot of rail transportation connected to the war. They knew my father would eventually get to Cincinnati. My mother had a lot of seniority with Cincinnati Public Schools right after the Depression and everything. So we maintained two households and I would ride the trains back and forth when my dad had to work a weekend. We'd go up to see him in Portsmouth or Columbus, wherever. Oh boy. And so mother, it was kind of hectic for a young man, but yeah. kind of interesting. Yeah, and your mother was here in the city while you were She dad was here in the city, so we maintained two households. Yeah. Where at in Cincinnati? Uh, grew up in Clifton, Howe and Whitfield next to the head of the, the, the gentleman that started the Disabled American Veterans, uh, Robert Marks. Robert was a, uh, Judge Marks was a captain in World War I and uh, founded the Disabled American Veterans here. And now I'm a member of chapter one, the mother chapter of the DAV. I see, I see. And uh, what grade school did you go to? Went to Clifton. I started there after I transferred from Portsmouth. I started at Clifton School. Went there through uh, the third and eighth grade. 
and uh, I have a grandson going to Fairview School right across. Uh, when I was a boy, that was the, I believe, the Emory Estate, and it was a huge mansion with all the servants and the chauffeurs, and I used to look out the Clifton School window and mm -hmm. see all the activity. Now that's been torn down for Fairview. And what high school did you go to? Hughes High School, right up the, uh, a couple of miles up the road from Clifton School. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, what years were that? Was uh, that? Uh, well, I liked Hughes High School so much, I stayed there five years <laughs> and graduated in 55 and uh, joined the Air Force immediately out of Hughes. I see. Um, just as an aside, uh, do you by any chance remember Pearl Harbor? I remember the feeling. Uh, uh, I remember being upset. Uh, you know, because the family, of course, was. Uh, I had an uncle in the Air Force. Of course, my father was, at that time, he was in Iceland, kind of preposition for the invasion. Uh, That's true. Even that early, Your they were. Your biological father. Yes, my biological father. So uh, we were all concerned, and uh, I remember the feeling. I didn't know all the details and mm -hmm. everything. And, so didn't you, understand the ramifications. Yeah. So you graduated from Hughes High School in 1955. Right. It's June of 55, I assume. Right. And when did you uh, join the Air Force? September of 55. Uh, what date did you join? At part time. Uh, people from Cincinnati were going to Sampson Air Force Base, New York. Kind of cold, I heard. Uh, if I went, my uncle was stationed at Chinute Air Force Base in Illinois. So. Uh, I flew out there, got airsick on the commercial Ozark Airline flying out to Indianapolis, going to join the Air Force. I was not real happy about that. Uh, so I enlisted there, or we would either be sent to Parks Field in California or Lackland Air Force Base in Texas. So I enlisted in Rantoul with the local recruiter. And where did you go through basic at? Went through basic at, ended up going to Lackland. Yeah. Uh, in those days, it was an 11 month or 11 week basic, mm -hmm. and uh, completed that in good shape. I see. Um, after your initial basic training, the 11 weeks there at Lackland, uh, did you go into a uh, an assigned field, a, a classification? I did. I went, and again, kind of unusual. Uh, on job training, I did not go to tech school. I was assigned to a unit called the Armament Systems Personnel Research Lab. We did psychological training and testing, uh, trying to find where they were having problems with a career field. We would uh, try to come up with an aptitude test to find people in basic training that would fit better into that particular skill level. The first field I worked with was photo interpretation, what I think is related to your field probably, right, in, in the service. And uh, we also worked, uh, at that time, the uh, WS-125A nuclear-powered bomber was in the works, and uh, we were concerned about maintaining with the radioactive elements involved with the engine, the power plant, uh, the maintenance of that. So uh, we were looking for dexterity skills with uh, the artificial arms, seeing what could be done with those, and ran student test subjects on that. Where did you go? Where were you doing this uh, developing and the training? It, we were at Lowry Air Force Base, which was pretty much the armament school for the Air Force. So we had the students right there in the career fields that we were interested in. Lowry being where? In Denver, Colorado, now closed, like many bases. Yes. Now, did you live on base at Lowry? I, as a young airman, I lived in the open bay barracks with the wood furnaces and yes. yeah. the ten-man latrines, yeah. Yes. Uh, did you, uh, how long were you uh, at, that, at that type of uh, training? I was in that assignment for two years. I see. I see. I uh, applied for aviation cadets. Uh, 
my vision was 2025, and uh, so I didn't make pilot training, but I did go to, uh, through pre-flight back to Lackland, uh, flew out of Harlingen Air Force Base, Texas, which was the navigator training school at the time. As I mentioned earlier, I spent five years at Hughes, so I was not a very good student, and uh, the course was very demanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, so after about 100 flying hours, I uh, decided that wasn't for me and left the cadet program. Now, were you being trained as a pilot or a navigator? Navigator, as a navigator. because of my vision, yeah. Very interesting. Wish I had a chance to do it today. I would have loved it. Yes. Yes. Um, so from uh, the two years that you were at Lowry, where did you go from there? To uh, Lackland, then to Harlingen in Texas, down uh, close to Yeah, and then from the navigation Brownsville. school. Uh, so I'm back in the personnel field as a, a personnel affairs specialist at Hanscom Field up in Massachusetts. Uh, another interesting assignment, a lot of history, a lot to learn in the uh, Right, we were right between Lexington and Concord. I was kind of a history buff, so mm -hmm. I really enjoyed my year up there. I see. And how long were you there? Just about a year, and I was separated there. My term uh, expired four years. And uh, so this is 1959. 59, right? And what did you do then? Came back to Cincinnati. Uh, Went to work for Procter & Gamble. Uh, uh, really missed the Air Force. And uh, after 72 days of making synthetic granules in St. Bernard, I uh, went up to the personnel office at wright Pat, re-enlisted, and uh, was stationed right at Wright-Patterson for several months. Uh so this is roughly 1960. That right, you, 59 into 60. Yeah, uh, so you got out September of 59, re-enlisted? In November uh, uh, 10th, I think, it, or yeah. 12th, yeah. Now, did you go back in at your, uh, the rank? That I you killed, uh, you had 90 days, and I maintained my rank, which was E3, a two-striper, uh, and got my re-enlistment bonus. I think in those days it was $450. Right, yeah, I remember that. The pay was $112.50 as yeah. a Airman Second Class. And that was like four times that. Right. That was your most. Uh, so you re-enlisted in November of 59, and then you were assigned to Wright-Patterson? Right. What field there? Uh, in personnel, again, I was, uh, we uh, ran the, they called it the Air Crew and Examining Test Center, and we tested everyone for commissions in the Air Force. OTS, the cadet program, and OCS were still open at the time. As well, it was the uh, kind of the initial years of the Air Force Academy, and we had those young men uh, for a week. Uh, they did physical uh, uh, training and testing, as well as physical exams, uh, aptitude, and written tests. So, I see, and. Uh how long were you there at Wright-Patterson? Uh, May of uh, 1960, I shipped out for uh, Rhine Main Air Base in Frankfurt, Germany, as a personnel specialist. Landed uh, at uh, the Flughof in Frankfurt. My boss met me at the plane and said, "Who have you ever done the morning report?" And I said, <laughs> I "Told him all the weird career fields I'd been in," and uh, so I learned the morning report and was in a personnel specialist in the orderly room of the 7167th Air Transport Squadron, long title, Medium Special Missions. Special Missions uh, meant that we flew uh, VIPs, now called Distinguished Visitors, around Europe. Our pilots and navigators were trained in the Middle East uh, navigation as well as Africa, and we even flew the ambassador into Moscow when he would rotate back into uh, Washington for briefings and things. And um, so we also did the AeroVac for that area. We'd bring them into Frankfurt, and then uh, they'd fly by uh, 135s back to 
McGuire out of there. What do you mean by air evac? Uh, aeromedical evacuation, uh, everything from getting people to the general hospitals in Germany from the small detachments in Turkey and Africa, Libya, and uh, Italy and uh, Greece, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, bring it. Uh, we did maternity, even uh, everything to get people to the general hospital for uh, medical care. Back here in the states. Well, some of it in Germany, and then if they were a serious case uh, injury or something, they would fly them immediately back. Now these to, are. Uh, these are peacetime uh, right, that you're referring right, to right now. Right, certainly. It was in 1960, 1960 even. Right. We're not involved in anything at that right. time. So, you, um, and, um, so you're in Frankfurt. Yes. Uh, Frankfurt on mine, is that That's the, correct. Yes. Um, and how long, how long did you stay there, Bob? Well, I stayed there. Uh, my biological father died. So I left early. Instead of spending the required three years, I left early. Interesting note, I, I was in that personnel field, and we were short. As I said, we hauled distinguished visitors, VIPs, and aircraft. They were old C-54s. We called them Cadillacs, because uh, they were pretty plush for the time. Mm -hmm. And we had flight attendants, of course, on those flights. Uh, there was a problem getting flight attendants assigned to us overseas. So I was asked to perform an additional duty as a flight attendant and uh, got quite interesting. Uh, took some great trips. It was like a vacation around Europe. Uh, one trip I hauled General Kufield, the staff judge advocate of the Air Force, uh, an idea of what my vacation's like. We picked the general up in Orly Field in Paris took him to Berlin, to Tempelhof, then went to Copenhagen, Oslo, and London. So I had five evenings in oh the great capitals of Europe. So I, was, I jumped on the opportunity to pour, perform. I didn't like all additional duties like right. KP, but I jumped on that one. That was fun and very interesting. Yeah, I can only imagine. Uh, you said you're... Uh, your biological father died. Yes, so he was at the U.S. Soldiers' Home in uh, Washington, D.C., and I got emergency leave into there uh, for his funeral. Did you go back to? Uh, I did not. I was too short. If you had under six months, they would PCS you, permanent change of station. Mm -hmm. And I had had my assignment before I left Germany. I knew where I was going. So they just changed my orders, and I reported to, after the emergency leave, reported to the Ninth Weather Recon Group in uh, McClellan Air Force Base in Sacramento, California. We were the, uh, under Air Weather Service and all the weather, Air Weather Squadron, such as the Tornado Hurricane Hunters, Tornado Chasers, and they came under the Ninth Weather Group. Again, I was and personnel function doing uh, officer manning. I see. And um, how long were you with the, with, at McClellan? Uh, while in Germany, I uh, saw these neat guys with this MACE missile. And I said, boy, that would be kind of neat to be on a launch crew for the MACE missile. And sitting at my desk, a Twix came in and said, looking for volunteers to be launch crew chiefs on the MACE missiles, so. What does, excuse me, what does MACE mean? Uh, it was MACE as in the weapon. Uh, W-A-C-E. We M-A-C-E. Yeah. And I'll describe that more after I get into that assignment. Okay. So uh, uh, I was only at McClellan from January to February of 19, uh, let me think, <laughs> 63. Three. Three. Right. Yeah and uh, retrained into the missile system. Went back to Denver, my original assignment, uh, for about a five-month school there and knowing just the hardware, the electronics of the uh, weapon system. Uh, we were then, in uh, April, we shipped out to Orlando Air Force Base. Uh, again, another base closed uh, in Orlando, Florida 
for a, a three-month combat crew training where we crewed up with our launch officer and our two mechanics and uh, actually ran missiles there, the engines, and uh, the, performed the uh, crew duties we would be doing in Germany. What, what branch of the Air Force was this? We were kind of under attack when we were in training uh, under the old uh, Tactical Air Command mm -hmm. uh, for training, war tack patches. Uh, we got through combat crew training. We got our pocket rocket, we called it the missile badge. Uh, very proud to receive that and went from there sure. to uh, Hahn Air Base in the Hunsruck of Germany, south of Koblenz. And uh, more training there at the training site uh, to make sure uh, we were ready to, uh, what they call combat ready. And uh, then we were sent out to the site as a new crew. And uh, that crew, you maintain that crew uh, togetherness all through combat crew training, crew training in Germany and on the site. It was a very integral part of the crew discipline and main maintenance. So your first missile site that you were assigned to is actually in Germany? It was. And uh, where in Germany? Uh, uh, outside uh, uh, Hahn Air Base, we, about 11 mile drive. Uh, South of Cologne, uh, Koblenz? Yeah, Koblenz and yeah. Yeah, in that, what they call the area called Hunsruck. Uh, I'm Kirschbaum I was a town I think we were closest mm -hmm. to. Uh, interesting thing about that is our missiles were pointed east, right up the road on the way to the site. You could see an old V-2 launcher or V-1 launcher, the earthworks and some uh, hardware and things there pointed west. Right. So that was quite in a, a brief period of time from 44, 45 to uh, 65 that how things had changed. I see. And uh, these missiles that you uh, were qualified on, what was your specific job with that missile? I was the launch crew chief. Uh, as I mentioned, we had a launch officer. And uh, as launch crew chief, I assisted him with communication, supervised the crew, uh, the two mechanics. Uh, we all had uh, performance tests to perform on the missile in case it was ready to, uh, we were going to launch it. Uh, I started the engines and uh, we got up to uh, idle RPM, electrical changeover on the missile system. I would notify the launch officers at the console next to me. He would take control, run it up to launch RPM, and fortunately we never did, but he would actually do the launching. There were a lot of human reliability controls built into it, uh, so no one person could could launch the missile. We were very closely supervised and, mm -hmm. and everything, but uh, that was... Uh, were these nuclear warheads or conventional? Or? They were. Uh, um, we had the code words, and that was part of my job. And we'd verify with the launch, the launch officer, and I would verify the inputting input data and the messages that would come in. How were the messages fed to you? You're, are you in a? a we were in a little, type of little house, about uh, a little right in the middle. We had four missiles in our. There were eight missiles on site, and there were four missiles assigned uh, to my crew, and. Uh, we were a little house probably in front of those missiles, about uh, 15 feet by 10 feet. We spent 12 or 14 hours in there, okay. depending on the site. And all our equipment was there. We maintained contact through, uh, we did have landlines, uh, but uh, microwave and radio were our primary communications for tactical traffic. So you're receiving you're receiving your orders from a remote distance from there. Uh, yes. Um, and you're relying on those orders right. whether to launch a missile or not. Right. And that was again 
seal code words. Everything was uh, very protected. Okay. And, uh, and they were nuclear. Yes. Uh, they were basically, if you're familiar with the F-80 or the T-33, sure. they were pretty much the F-80, one of some of the original early fighters with a guidance system on them. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, did you ever, you were on, I guess, what they called alert? That's yes. Sort of, many times? Yes. Uh, we pulled uh, three shifts on 12 hours or depending on the site, some went 10 because you were busy during the day doing maintenance runs and... Now, someone's in that site 24-7, is that correct? Pardon? Someone is... Right, oh yes. So you're... Yeah. you're and we maintain radio contact yeah. throughout that. So you had, what, two shifts a day or three shifts? We just had one 12-hour one shift. Okay. And uh, then you came back in 12 hours, and then another uh, got a little cruise. sleep and came back and right. pulled another 12-hour shift. Now, uh, did you ever have any situations where you were on alert and you didn't know if you were going to launch or not? Or? It never got, again, it was pretty calm times. Uh, we were aware of the, of the Russians. Russians were well aware of us, uh, but nothing. I had to, <clears throat> I did get some official traffic one day, and I was shaking like a leaf, but it was not uh, as important as it first came across. It was just merely a code word change, which they did periodically. But you were going to, tell to hear us that real thing come across the radio, it was a little unsettling. Yeah. You were going to tell us what MACE stands for? Uh, it's just MACE, the MACE, the old MACE weapon the, uh, oh, from back in, uh, 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 our symbol was, was the MACE, the club with a chain, a ball. Uh, some of them had a chain and ball, some just had a ball, spike ball on the end. And now, how long were you stationed there at uh, the site in, uh, below Cove Blanche? Not very long. We phased, uh, the missile was kind of obsolete and, uh, at the, by the time I got there, even. And I was only there a couple of years, and uh, we phased the system out, and I was transferred back to the States for retraining. For retraining? In another system, yeah, because okay. they, were, of course, weren't used in the States. There was no place that they were employed. So... Uh, so uh, what was your, what were you retrained in? What well, missile? I was, again, uh, kind of an interesting assignment. Uh, uh, I was assigned to Holloman Air Force Base, which is part of uh, White Sands Missile Range in Alamogordo, New Mexico. I was assi assigned to what was called the Missile and Drone Launch Branch. Uh, uh, part of the Air Force Missile Development Center under Air Research and Development Command. Uh, our job was to prepare uh, rockets. Uh, we used obsolete Army rockets, the Honest John, the Nike, as well as scientific rockets produced by Thiokol and various explosive companies yes. uh, to launch suborbital payloads. Uh, we did contract work for AFCO, uh, General Electric, uh, NASA, DASA, the Defense Atomic Support Agency, and uh, the uh, drones were pine They were a lot, having a lot of trouble with the AIM-9 Sidewinder in Vietnam going off course, so uh, F-4s would fire against our drones, which we would launch, uh, and uh, so, how long were you there then? We, I was there about three years. Uh, this the while there, we did some of the uh, ni very initial work on the UAVs that you hear about today. Uh, we what, would launch what does uh, UAV mean? the uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, mm -hmm. the drones today that for surveillance. We didn't have the uh, surveillance equipment they have today, so our work was pretty basic. They were anxious to get something to do in Vietnam to give them some. What years was this you were there at? Uh, I was 66 to 69. Uh, 
left there, volunteered for an assignment in an upgraded version of the MACE. It was uh, called the MACE B-Bird. Uh, and uh, they had a more sophisticated uh, internal guidance system, and they were launched from a term we didn't particularly like, coffin-guided missiles. Uh, we were kind of underground, and they came out launched at uh, launched attitude, large 200,000-pound doors dropped, and the missile would be launched uh, at, through a launch attitude. And these are nuclear missiles also? As well. Uh, of course, we were on Okinawa. And they did have them in Germany at the same time I was, but again, they were phased out shortly after we were. And uh, so we were in Okinawa close to the Chinese mainland. You were stationed there? Yes. I didn't get that. You went from where? Uh, from White Sands. I had to go through retraining at Lowry again. Oh, okay. And we did all our combat crew and everything at Lowry at that time and uh, retrained in the new system. So, and from there you went to uh, Okinawa? Okinawa. Is that Naha or Kadena? Uh, Kadena. Okay. And uh, didn't stay there long uh, with the uh, detente with China. Uh, the Chinese were not. This is from a guy way down the ladder. Right. But my impression is the Chinese were not real happy about having those missiles on Okinawa. So uh, we phased that out. And I was only there a very short time and came back to the States. And where to? Uh, to Wright Patterson Air Force Base, right up the road. I was assigned to the 17th Bomb Wing, another missile system, the Hound Dog, which was an air-to-service missile, AGM 28B, was launched off the B-52. The B-52 carried two Hound Dogs in wing. Again, I went back to uh, retrain, was sent to a field training detachment at Barksdale Air Force Base, Louisiana, to learn the guidance system on the uh, Hound dog. Mm -hmm. And from there? From back to Wright Pat for work with the bomb wing. I see. Uh, I was supervisor of uh, missile control. We scheduled all the maintenance, uh, work with uh, maintenance analysis for the best system to put on an airplane. Uh, and this is, uh, what is this, early 70s now? Uh, or? Early 70s. I see. And uh, by this time, what rank are you at? Uh, I was a uh, tech sergeant. Tech sergeant. Shortly tech after I arrived at Wright Pat. Um, the highlight of that, I guess, was the Arab Israeli War. Uh, we were on full alert for that. Um, in 73, that was October okay, 73. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, uh, so this is 73. Um, and you are what age now? Um, are Gosh, you married? Uh, Thirty-seven, yet, married. Are you couple married? of kids. I married. Was married uh, while stationed at Wright Pat, to a hometown gal from Cincinnati. What and year did you get married? Got married in uh, uh, June of seventy. Nineteen seventy. And I was stationed at Wright Pat at the time. Oh, I see. And your wife's name? Uh, Diane. Diane uh, maiden name was Biting. She was a teacher in the Cincinnati public school system. And, uh, and the children that you had? Uh, in, uh, I got three Air Force brats and two after we retired. Uh, Ellen uh, works for uh, Cincinnati Recreation Commission. Uh, Joe uh, is a uh, former Marine Embassy guard. And uh, Mary works for uh, Council on Aging here in Cincinnati. We had, they're my Air Force brats, and I had two others after we retired. And uh, what, what are their names? Uh, John, who just presented me with my fifth grandson yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, Luke Churchill, my father's name, and uh, Jeffrey. Jeffrey is currently a major. Uh, Joe, didn't listen to Dad. Jeff didn't listen to Dad about the great Air Force life with right. hot meals and right. clean sheets. He went in the Army, and 
he's a tanker uh, by profession. Right now he's assigned to the asymmetric warfare group at Fort Meade, Maryland as a major. I'm I very see. proud of him. Uh, I can imagine, sure. But, uh, so we're in 1973, the Arab-Israeli war, and you're at Wright-Patterson. Right. And uh, your field there again was? Uh, basic the missile guidance system. Missile guidance system. Yeah. And uh, so how long did you, uh, what, what happens after 1973? Well, I was going to Wright State. We owned a home in Dayton and getting ready to retire. And I went down to personnel and said, I'd like to get a freeze to stay on base since I'm close to retirement. And they said, well, you've been assigned to Griffiths Air Force Base in upstate New York. We had two children at the time, quite young. And uh, I had been a very fortunate, I was the SAC NCO of the year at Wright Pat, so I pulled every string I, I could and did, none the, of them uh, worked. Excuse me for interrupting you, is sure. that this picture here? That is, would, that's, uh, this is a picture with uh, Colonel Rue. And uh, Colonel Rue, incidentally, uh, led the linebacker two assault and B-52s on Vietnam after he left the our bomb wing. And so, pretty proud of that. Yes. Um, while we're doing that picture, and before we get to your retirement, uh, I'd like for you to show this picture also, Bob, and explain what that is. This is one of the uh, missiles I uh, mentioned earlier at White Sands. This is the old Army blockhouse that's featured in many of the early uh, science fiction movies. Again, I mentioned that we use an Honest John, which this motor is, a Nike, and up here's the payload. There were 52 rockets, and actually we did, a, we did another launch at a different site with an Honest John Nike, Nike, and then the payload. So there were two Nikes there. My job was to go up in the biggest cherry picker I ever saw and arm those 52 bazooka rocket motors, which put the spin uh, on the payload. The purpose of that, this payload was, we launched for NASA, and it was the initial testing of the parachute to land an instrument package on Mars. So that was interesting, fun to push the button and watch those oh, go. I can only imagine. Take off. I can only imagine. Uh, so we were at, uh, this is the middle 70s, and yeah. you're getting close to retirement. And so you go to ask to be froze at uh, personnel office. Personnel, yeah. And what happened? Yeah. They sent me to the 416th Bomb Wing. They said they really need you up there. And uh, again, it was kind of my fate with weapon system. I was a reverse Midas touch. Every time I got in a system, it went obsolete. So. I arrived there with my wife and my two little ones living in base, on base housing. Where's this at? At Griffiths in Rome, New York. It was a great assignment, a wonderful part of the country. And uh, really enjoyed the folks up there and the area. Uh, but they said, well, uh, we're phasing the system out, so you're going to be assigned a minute man on the North Slope in Dakota or Montana. I had just moved there with a wife and two little ones. And, uh, uh, my first sergeant had some pull with base personnel, and they were looking for an old personnel man. So I went back into my original career field, was a non-commissioned officer in charge of classification and training until my retirement in May of 76. And where were you at in May of 76 when you retired? At Griff, still at Griffiths. Oh, I stayed on oh, post, yeah, okay. at, at Griffiths. And so you retired ran classification as, uh, and training. Did you retire as a master sergeant? I did. I was promoted to uh, master uh, shortly after I retrained into personnel. So that was a good part of all that and was able to retire as a master sergeant. So you retired in May of 1976, and right. then you and the family moved back to Cincinnati? We moved back to Cincinnati, uh, my wife being a Cincinnati girl and part of a large family. Uh, that, there was no question that that would happen. Uh, came back and, uh, very fortunate, uh, began work with Cincinnati Millicron. And a personnel guy later told me that one of the 
uh, reasons they hired me was that they had read some of my performance reports, saw some of my duties, reading blueprints, uh, electrical diagrams, and they thought that that fit the need and the requirement that they held. So uh, I was able to spend 25 years there. Oh. Uh, for the last several years, I was uh, the uh, uh, government order specialist for government orders and worked with military and government agencies uh, uh, with uh, service parts for their machines, planning and directing and helping with their contracts. Well, it sounds like you enjoyed your career and had exciting uh, different jobs. I did, both of them were. From the beginning of the missile system all the way up to the our most advanced ones in the 1970s. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, Can't think of a thing. I, uh, I just, uh, it was very rewarding. Uh, of course, like many of us in my youth, I would have done things differently, but uh, the Air Force was always good to me and continue to be at uh, 77. So uh, uh, I have to say, look back on it with fondness. And, well, we appreciate you being here and having this interview with us today. And, My uh, pleasure. Thanks again. You're quite welcome, Ray. Okay. Thank you. Sure.